Nix's video phone. Welcome to Hidden Gem Horror, Episode 1. The point of this series is to shine a light on lesser known horror films with a lot of heart in them, so I figured why not start with one of my favorites. I would not be doing a plot synopsis, giving any tips or hints as to what this film is about before the video begins. I highly recommend that you watch this movie for yourself and then come back and continue the video. If you do decide to watch the film, do not watch the trailer or look at any promotional material for it, as it, in my opinion, will ruin the film. Do yourself a favor, trust me, and watch this one. One last thing before we begin the video, I will be giving a full walkthrough recap of the film in a condensed version. It is also worth mentioning that films from me are reviewed and rated based on my own system. We have four key areas that will be covered, with three subcategories in each, except the last one, for a total of ten subcategories. If you want to see my full in-depth version of the rating system, the link is in the description. Now, let's begin. This is End of the Line. The film opens in a dark subway. It's here that we meet our protagonist, Karen. She's riding the subway to an unknown destination. She looks around the subway car and notices that there are a few other occupants with her. She has an envelope with her from a woman named Vivian, with some interesting text on it. Keep that in mind, we'll circle back and discuss that later. Let's find out what's inside the envelope. Ha! <laughs> did that get you? Let me know down in the comments if it did. Here Karen appears to be drowning in a pool of blood, but in reality, is it all in her head? A nightmare? Or a hallucination? Now Karen is in her home, drying off after taking a shower. She has a radio playing in the background, giving out some interesting information. Let's take a listen. Now at almost the same time, a woman is in a subway station waiting on her train. She appears to be a bit distraught and nervous. She notices a man standing further down the metro facing away from her. As the train gets closer, the man also gets closer to her, and she begins to hear strange, eerie voices calling out. Eventually the man turns around to reveal a similar face to ones previously seen on the train with Karen. The unknown woman then jumps in front of the train, committing suicide. Now later in the evening, we see Karen in a hospital where she works as a psychiatric nurse. She is examining a man who seems to be incoherent and is speaking about demons and hearing eerie voices. He then begins to swallow a cross necklace and eventually does so as Karen calls for help. Karen and another nurse then sedate the man. Now we jump further in time into the evening where Karen is walking down the hospital hall where she is approached by another colleague and they discuss the large influx of patients into the hospital that evening. The other colleague also mentions that it could be an eclipse and a full moon tonight, so it's bringing out all the crazy people. Karen is then approached by yet another colleague who brings up the news of a former patient committing suicide. This patient turns out to be Vivian, the woman we saw earlier. Now Karen is in an office, resting after a long day of work, when she notices another envelope given to her by Vivian. This one has a little bit more information than the last. Let's take a look. While looking through these photos, Karen begins to get very upset, given Vivian's recent suicide. But then she notices something on this last photo that really startles her. Sorry, 
two jump scares already yeah i know they're pretty good in this movie i like them so i'm gonna throw them in there occasionally i might warn you i might not who knows anyway jumping forward later on into the evening we see karen going home she's at the subway waiting for her train when she notices another man also waiting for his train karen and the man smile at each other and kind of do that thing where you look at each other all friendly like then we see another man approach karen from behind let's take a look at his introduction and see what we think Hey. Hey, I'm talking to you. You got a cigarette? No, I don't. Oh, come on, just one cigarette. Look, I don't have any. I don't smoke, okay? Oh, well, don't be afraid of lung cancer. You gotta live in the moment, pretty lady. <laughs> Carpet diem and shit. Enjoy it now, because I might not be here tomorrow. What you reading? Look, you can have it. I'm finished. Hey, what's your name? Oh, that's all right. You don't have to tell me your name. I already know it. Cut face. The unknown man then fakes a conversation with Karen, pretending to know her in order to save her from the creep currently harassing her. Later on, it is revealed that the creep's name is Patrick. This deters Patrick, and he then walks away. Karen and the unknown man then walk to the other side of the subway station, making small talk. Eventually, she tells him that she has had a long day and does not want to conversate. He advises her to stay close for safety's sake. Did anyone notice the book in the unknown man's hand? Karen then walks to the edge of the train station. Here's your warning. Jump scare incoming. So Karen has a hallucination of Vivian's death. Then we get a proper introduction between her and the unknown man. I'm sorry, Karen. I'm Mike. Thank you so much, Mike. Shortly after this, we see Karen, Mike, and Patrick all board the train to leave. But before we fully depart, we see a religious magazine laying on the metro floor. Karen enters a subway car by herself and then suddenly the train abruptly stops and loses power. During this time, she starts hearing voices and we see yet another hallucination of Vivian's death. Right after this, Mike comes in to check on her where they both scare the shit out of each other. After scaring each other, Mike and Karen then have a conversation about how they were both unable to understand anything the conductor was saying on the intercom and they make remarks about how terrible the intercom system sounds. Karen says she's been hearing things outside of the train and asks Mike if he hears the same, to which he responds he doesn't. They wait for a moment, hear another noise, and this time Mike says he does hear it. They both get up and look out the window to investigate. During this time, Betty comes in to meet Mike and Karen. She begins to make conversation with them until she gets a notification from her pager. Once she sees the message, things change very quickly. Do you see anything? I'm not sure. Karen then pleads with Betty to put the knife down, but Betty doesn't listen to her. Betty yells at them and tells them that she has to save their souls and that the time of reckoning has come. During this, another group of cult members come in from the opposite side of the train, so Karen and Mike decide to get the fuck out. Now we jump back in time to when the train first arrived and we meet Julie. Patrick comes in and asks if she wants to make some money, to which she declines. Patrick says that that answer is wrong, and then pushes the emergency stop button. Patrick, being the shitty guy that he is, then assaults her. Side note, fuck Patrick. John and Sarah are a young couple in love, showcasing questionable levels of public affection. John wants to get intimate with Sarah, but she says she can't. She then changes her mind, and John responds, saying they might not have enough time. Sarah then gives him this response. Maybe you should stop talking and start fucking me. <laughs> the train conductor goes to see who pushed the emergency stop button and walks past more cult members. The conductor goes to interrogate Julie and Patrick, yet doesn't realize the assault taking place. Julie then tells the conductor that she pushed the button as a joke. He tells them not to cause any more trouble and leaves. 
Patrick then laughs after getting away with it and yells the film's title right into Julie's ear. You heard the man? No trouble until we get to the end of the line. <laughs> man, that's funny. Don't you get it? End of the line! John and Sarah decide to have sex in the middle of the night on a subway car. That's a completely normal thing to do, right? Sarah then decides to take a stroll out on the train tracks with John. Now more cult members get pager notifications with the same message as the one that Betty received earlier, and we are back in the present. Here we see that not all members of the cult are on board with what the pager is telling them to do. It's, it's gotta be a mistake. It's no mistake, Jack. This is it. No, wait, 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 wait a minute. This is, this is serious. Let's wait until we get out and call someone. Oh no, this is it. There's no time. It's right here and now. Let's go. The conductor radios a maintenance member named Davis, telling him that the train should be operational and be running again soon. We cut back to see Julie still being assaulted by Patrick. Patrick then gets the same pager notification as the others, and while he's distracted, Julie reaches for the pepper spray in her purse and uses it on Patrick. She then manages to flee the train car and get away from him. The train regains its power, and it's here that we learn that Sarah is also a cult member since she gets the same pager notification. She then begins to freak out and convinces John not to get back on the train and that they need to leave immediately. One of the cult members wields fucking Excalibur, and now all hell breaks loose. These two women have a case of wrong place, wrong time. Hey, you can't be it! Oh! That's a brutal way to go out if you ask me. The two unknown women on the train are then savagely killed as the cult members tell them that God loves them. Julie then runs into the same car as the killings are happening and immediately 180s out of there. <laughs> Here we meet Neil right at the start of the chaos. Hey, guys, what the... Fuck! Back in the other train car, after killing the women, the two cult members confront Jerry as to why he didn't help. Suddenly one of them begins to flail and convulse on the ground. The other man then saves him by killing him, releasing him from quote unquote demons. Jerry is then pressured into joining him on this mission, which he reluctantly does. As everyone flees from the cult, we see Davis and Frankie wondering what's going on. On the tracks? Are you crazy? Get the cops, man! The group makes it to a maintenance room to seek safety from the cult with them right on their heels. Once inside the room, Neil immediately tells Davis to call the police, but the phone doesn't work. Neil then asks if anyone has a cell phone, to which Sarah responds saying yes, but she has no signal unfortunately. Neil then asks Davis if the door is solid and he responds saying yeah. Smart moves for Neil I would say. Listen well, Betty listen. begins to speak to them through the door. The Let's hear what she has to say. You will open this door and let us do God's holy work. Judgment is passed on your soul. Oh, Jesus Christ, man, they're fucking nuts. This is your Betty is definitely all for rocker. Look, lady, we're not coming out, okay? And the cops are gonna be here soon, so you and your friends should just get the fuck out of here. Tell him, John. Neil listens and doesn't hear anything, so he believes that they have left. Karen then asks Frankie for first aid for Mike's wounds. I'll get it. Somebody want to tell me what the fuck's going on here? The voice of eternal hope members. Thank you. They got a message on their pagers and just started attacking. Julie tells Davis to use his pager and find out if the cult is still outside. He radios Bernie the conductor and gets no response. John then tells him that he's gone. Neil tells Davis to check the TV, but every channel only shows the same thing. They then check the radio and get nothing. They've taken control of all the transmissions. It, uh, 
It must be happening everywhere. You can't be sure of that. The phones, the radio, and the TV all go out at the same time. Karen talks to Mike about his wound and how he is feeling. Neil then tells the group that he has to leave to find his family. John objects and says that the door stays closed. They're gone anyhow. Yeah? What if that's what they want us to think, huh? You see, because they're all quiet and shit now to make us think that they're gone. And then as soon as we open the door, bingo. I'm not asking anyone to fall. Look, man, that door is not open. Get out of my way. Hey, 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 hey! The group discusses whether leaving or staying, and which is the best option. Karen then brings up the fact that the cult members could have killed other Subway members and took their keys and are coming back to get them. John quickly changes his mind after Sarah whispers in his ear, telling him that they will come back. The majority of the group then decides to leave. Davis and Frankie decide to stay behind. Neil says to look for weapons and then Davis opens a cabinet, providing them with an assortment of close-range weapons. Davis also hands Neil a walkie-talkie to stay in contact. Frankie then gives them a key, telling them that there is another room up ahead if they need somewhere safe to hide. Neil checks the stairs to make sure it's clear and the group begin to go back into the tunnel. Julie suggests going back to the tracks, but Neil says it will be easier for the cult to find them. So they decide to stick to the smaller tunnels and eventually they will reach the next station. Shit, what if they have guns, huh? I'm not gonna stand a fucking chance. No, they won't use guns. Only swords and daggers. How do you know that? Blades are symbols of their faith. Guns are impure. Yeah? Well, if I see any of those motherfuckers, I'm gonna ring their symbol. Ping! Hey, look, we only fight them if we have to. I know a lot of people who are Voice of Hope members. They're good people. Decent. Neil sure seems to know a lot about the voice of Eternal Hope. Julie then tells them not to talk so much as the sound will carry. We cut back to see Davis and Frankie still hold up in the room. They discuss whether or not they made the right decision by staying. Frankie then says he hasn't eaten much and Davis offers him some food. As Davis goes to get the food, he hears a pager going off in Frankie's locker. He then asks Frankie to explain himself. We jump back to see the group in the tunnel. Come on, Tommy, let's save him. God is with us, Tommy, don't be afraid. I'll tell Pa. Kid, you better follow your brother. Seriously, kid, get the fuck out of here. I'm not afraid. God is great. God is hope. The kid takes a nasty hit to the head and eventually dies in Karen's arms. He was just a kid. He's a kid with a fucking knife. But look, I didn't want to, but I'm... Hey, you did what you had to. Neil tells the group, regardless of kids or not, they will get out of there, and they progress further into the tunnels. We once again cut back to Davis and Frankie. Davis wants to know whether Frankie is one of the cult members or not. He makes Frankie open the locker and he checks his pager. The pager says to do your duty. Frankie tells Davis he joined after he met his wife, but then tells him he would never hurt anyone. Davis then kicks Frankie out of the room. We see that the group is still traveling the tunnels. Where are they? Hi. What did you see? I thought I saw something. Karen really is losing it, huh? Don't scream for nothing, okay? Right, don't make it easier for them to find us. It's okay. Did you see something? Just leave him. Well, you got a better idea. We can't take him with us. He's hurt. Come on, come on. John. Come on. 
Frankie pleads with Davis to be let back in. Davis tries reaching out to other maintenance members but gets no response. Open it. They might be in there. We have to help him. Okay, but make it fast. I want to get out of here. Yeah, amen to that. Okay. You open the door. Everyone else in attack position. Ready? Go. Jesus fucking Christ! Oh, I, I, this isn't what it looks like. Oh, no, I surrender. Please don't hurt me. I look. And I cut up a hope member as well, and I had a really good reason to. So if you just give me a chance and let me explain, please, please, please. Get up. Get up. Get up. Sit in that chair. Well, look who is back. Find something to tie him up. Karen and Sarah help John onto a table as he is severely wounded from the attack earlier. Mike ties Patrick to the chair with duct tape. John is clearly in agonizing pain and he tells the group that he didn't want to hurt the kids. Julie then confronts Patrick and he makes a rude remark to her. She then spits on him. After which he calls her a slur and she punches the shit out of him and proceeds to give him a few good kicks. Neil then restrains her. Neil tells Patrick not to speak again and if he does, Julie can have him. Julie then tells Karen what happened between her and Patrick. Karen then tells the group that they can't move John due to his injuries. Frankie sees something in the tunnel and begs to be let back in. After some convincing, Davis tells him that he'll let him back in, but if he tries anything, he'll clock him. But right as he does so, the TV begins to broadcast. What are you seeing tonight? Around you? On the streets? This is the final battle, children. It's between God and the devil. Who do you want to win your soul? Because this is the night. The Armageddon is upon us. The holy rapture of the apocalypse is now, right now. You have seen the signals, the bells have chimed all over the world. It has become chaos. Chaos has arrived. For all those who remain alive when the trumpets of Gideon are heard will be condemned to eternal damnation. The dead will rise, possessed by the spawns of the devil. You heard me right, children. The Satan builds his godless armies tonight. So remember. Now is the time to be strong. God needs you. I need you. And the souls. The souls of the people you will send into God's carrying arms tonight. They need you the most. So pick up your blessed days. And do what God himself begs you to do. Save the souls. What's too late? Save their souls, children! Save their souls! I beg you! Leave with you! God needs you! Amen! Karen and the group then turn on their flashlights after the power outage. Everybody, everybody, okay, it was fake. Those images he showed, they're not real. He attacked the TV station, now he's got control of the board so he can... <laughs> what about all those people dying? <laughs> they're just special effects, okay? They're, they're not real. I really hope you're fucking right, buddy. God, the guy's a nutcase. <laughs> Don't tell me you actually believe in this wrath of God bullshit. You seem very sure of yourself. Okay, buddy. If you know something, now's the time to spill it. <laughs> well, you see, I'd like to keep an open mind. I mean, what if the Reverend's actually right? Patrick explains that's why he was cutting up the bodies to prevent them from coming back. He then further tells them that he wants to have some fun with it and that the other cult members are too serious. No time to get intimate with the lovely ladies. I just want a little action before I go. I mean, can you believe it? I'm still a virgin. Charmer like me. So how about it? You want to pop my cherry? <laughs> John says he can move, but Karen says if he moves too much, he could die. Neil then tells the group that they have to move out. He tells them that if anyone has to use the bathroom, now is the time. So I gotta take a major dump. Actually, I gotta go too. Oh, so do I. Not sure why that line is in there, but it made me laugh a bit. Karen and Mike sit down and she tells him about the patient that committed suicide earlier in the day. 
She tells him about the things that she's been seeing throughout the night, and Mike proceeds to explain it in a rational way. He then tells her that he doesn't believe in heaven or hell or the apocalypse, to which she agrees, but says she is still scared of things in the dark. Neil radios Davis. We're safe. And when we find help, we'll send it your way. Hey, make it quick, will you? And be careful. <laughs> Davis, come in. Davis, you okay? The group then decides to leave, with Sarah staying behind to look after John. Patrick is tied to the chair with duct tape, so he isn't going anywhere. Don't hurt me. I I'm a Hope member. Yeah, we're both voice members, but with all the fighting and confusion. It is a sin to lie, my child. But you will still be saved. Frankie, tell him I'm with you. Frankie, please! I'm sorry. You son of a bitch! Oh God, no, 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 please. Oh, don't. Oh, for God's sake. No, oh, child. This is for God. Oh, no, 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 Betty tells Frankie that he has to prove his faith by saving Brenda, his wife. She begs him to kill her, telling him she is plagued by the devil and demons. Frankie is very resistant, saying he can't do it. Brenda then stabs him several times. The cult then takes turns stabbing Brenda. Even Jerry stabs her. They lay Brenda down next to Frankie. They even cut out her baby and place it with them before stabbing Frankie in the heart. What an absolutely heartbreaking way to die, seeing your wife and child killed before you. Back with the group, we see them traveling down another tunnel trying to find freedom. Patrick talks to Sarah, telling her he knows her from the church. Turns out Patrick is a high-ranking member of the church. He tells her to untie him, since the other cult members will be coming soon, and it could look real bad with him being tied up. John then tells him to... Fuck off! Patrick tells her he knows that she has been intimate with John. He threatens to tell the other cult members about her sin and she will be damned for eternity. Sarah runs off to the bathroom, getting sick. She then begins to clean herself with soap while crying. Sarah helps Patrick get loose. Patrick then tells Sarah to save John as he pleads for his life. Sarah can't do it, but Patrick plunges the knife into John, killing him. The group hears a woman scream and assume it could be Sarah. Patrick then proceeds to assault Sarah, but is interrupted by the cult. Patrick then immediately snitches on her and says he was bewitched by her. Betty asks for the truth and Sarah breaks down crying. She is then stabbed and killed by Patrick. Betty then confronts Patrick regarding his purity. Patrick? Are you still pure? Oh yeah, baby. I'm as pure as snow. He then apologizes and he says he is still with them on their mission to save everyone. Don't come any closer. Or we'll kill you, I swear. Look, just walk away and you won't get hurt. Cannot hurt us. Julie and Karen manage to down one cult woman as Mike is overpowered and stabbed from another cult member. They use Neil's shirt as a tourniquet on Mike's leg to stop the bleeding. Julie tells Neil to go to his family and he promises to return with help. 
Karen and Julie help carry Mike till they hear more cult members incoming. Mike tells them to leave, and Julie says she is sorry and does so. Mike and Karen share a tender kiss, and as Karen leaves, Mike tells her to make a lot of noise as she rounds the corner, and she does. Karen goes down a dark tunnel as she is chased by the cult. Patrick sees her shadow and instructs the cult members to go a different way, and he heads in her direction. Call that divine intervention. <laughs> Neil makes it to the surface and Karen gets stuck in a dead end tunnel. Julie makes it to a train, but finds a locked door as the cult approaches her. Neil is at the entrance of the subway and witnesses the chaos also happening outside. Look at the sky, brother! It's starting! It's happening! It's happening! Oh, oh God. Neil dies in Betty's arms after a stab wound to the spine. You motherfucker! Come on! Stay the fuck away from me! Fuck you! Stay the fuck away from me! Come on out. <laughs> Colt then lets Julie live following the pager message and take pills to kill themselves. Jerry says he can't do it, but they say they will force him if he doesn't, so he reluctantly gives in. soon if it's the end of the line. <laughs> Will we witness the apocalypse or not? What do you think? Hmm? You know, everybody's been seeing the signs of God. Except me. What is that supposed to mean? Am I not part of God's big picture? Am I not good enough? Fuck them! Patrick sure has a lot of issues. Mike hobbles down a tunnel hoping to find a way out. Betty shows up telling Patrick how now is the time to take their pills. He then promptly stabs her. Let me make this perfectly fucking clear. Either you are going to fuck me willingly, 
or I am going to hurt you. Patrick, that's enough. Karen then pleads with Patrick, saying she can help him. I'm sorry. It's too late. <laughs> say good riddance Patrick. Betty is still alive and tells Karen the end times are coming. She then swallows her pill and dies. Julia is still on the train when all the power goes out and eventually her flashlight as well. What a terrifying moment to be in. Mike is still going down the tunnel when he comes across the kid from earlier. The kid blames him for everything and is about to try and kill him when he sees something behind Mike. The kid then runs off and Mike looks back to see what he saw. <laughs> end. That's how this film ends, and I love it. Before I dive into the review, let's circle back to a few things I mentioned earlier on in the video. First is the envelope that Karen has with the words Claviceps purpurea ergot. This is a fungus that affects grain and rye. Once humans ingest tainted products with it, there have been reports of hallucinations. During the Middle Ages, there were epidemics caused by ergotism, commonly known as St. Anthony's Fire. This is also a possible reason for what would later be known as the Salem Witch Trials. If you are interested in learning more on the subject, the link is in the description. Secondly, the radio broadcast is particularly important as it sets the stage that the cult has already been doing missions to some degree as indicated by the high death count. Finally, the last thing I want to mention is the book Mike has in his hand earlier on into the film. This book is Carl Sagan's The Demon Haunted World. Now I haven't read this book, but the synopsis has the goal of the book to explain the scientific method, critical and skeptical thinking to everyday people. This honestly fits Mike's character very well once you know this. There is an extensive article I will link that goes into detail about the book below. I would recommend checking it out. Now let's give it a review and discuss what I like, dislike and felt could be improved. At the end of the review, I will sign the film a blood drop score of 1 through 10 depending on how I felt it did in each area covered. I promise I will discuss the end of the film. Let's start with the film basics. Music and sound. The soundtrack played excellently in building tension, providing subtle yet important effects, and I absolutely love the opening intro to the film. Martin Godier is the composer for the film, and I believe he did a fantastic job on it. A perfect blend of dark, otherworldly, and religious tones are used throughout the film. There are several high-tension parts of the film that are elevated purely off the audio used. Here is an audio clip from the credits of the film. This is a song sang a fair amount throughout the film by various cult members and it's just great. Editing and effects. Overall I really enjoyed how the film was edited together and broken up into pieces. 
It worked really well in keeping you invested in each character and where they were at each point. At no point was I left scratching my head wondering why they cut there. The effects in this film were great. A ton of practical effects were used in the creation of the creatures seen throughout. The decapitation scene, the axe scene, and a lot of the stab wounds just looked phenomenal. I'm unsure to as the budget of the film, as I was unable to find any information on it. But the director, Maurice Devereaux, did an excellent job with what was available. Cinematography. This one can always be a touchy subject for some people. I really liked how they didn't cut away from shots and held them for a while. There were some great shots in the film from various angles and overall it did good. Nothing unseen before, but that's not a crime. On to story and characters. Acting. This is a lower budget film, so acting can vary, but standouts were Tim Roseanne as John and Robin Wilcock as Patrick. Both these actors did a great job at adding believability and depth to their respective characters. I really enjoy John throughout this film, and Tim just did a fantastic job. Robin Wilcock as Patrick provided an unsettling and love to hate them performance as Patrick. A character you really hated and wanted to get killed. Dialogue. The dialogue throughout the film was pretty straightforward and can definitely be seen as real as to what would happen with characters in this situation. One minus is the bathroom part, but I get why it's there as comedic relief, but it just felt a bit out of place for me. There's a lot of arguing as to who I can trust and do I have faith in this person, and it adds a lot of depth to realism in my opinion. Story and characters. Plot. I really like the plot of the film. It's nothing that hasn't been done before, but not quite in this way. The whole cult members try to kill people and save them angle, you know, that's been done. However, the execution is really on point throughout the film. These people are in a fight for their lives and it's between hiding or fighting. I love the fact that it's set in a subway, it adds so much to the claustrophobia aspect. There is no easy way out. On to directing. Director's vision. I really feel as though the film had a clear vision going into it with an end goal in mind. Some films feel so disjointed, but not this one. The director knew what he wanted to create and did it. I really enjoyed the style and overall the direction the film had. Who is the audience? Obviously this film isn't for everyone. Honestly I feel as though this film is really mainly for the hardcore horror fans. Those who like all aspects of the genre. The pace and overall plot arc is a tad different from standard films as the build up is long and it doesn't flow into the typical plot model. I do believe this film achieved for what it set out to be. This is one for the horror fans by a horror fan. If you enjoy gory kills, cults, and subways, then this is for you. Lesson and theme. The overarching theme and lesson would be faith and trust. Faith in your religious beliefs. Trust in others. Throughout the film, faith and trust are on firm display in most scenes. The characters don't know who to trust or if the faith in the cult is the right thing. I love this being reinforced throughout the duration of the film all the way to the very end. And finally, the hidden gem horror factor. This film to me is remarkably unique. An interesting and original idea executed in a stellar way. The film is not perfect, but nothing is. But for what it is, it's damn close. As for the ending, I love it. I love the idea of the cult being right. Well, let me explain a bit. It's meant to be purposely left open to interpretation as to whether the demons in the end are real or not, as Karen has hallucinations throughout the film. However, what makes me believe that the demons are real is in fact that she still has shadows on her face after she reopens her eyes. This could just be an error, but I don't think so. If it's meant to be a hallucination, then the actors could have just left the frame to not call shadows. So this leads me to the conclusion that, at the end of the film, the voice of Eternal Hope was right. Not right about killing everyone, but right about the apocalypse. As for this film... It gets a 8.5 blood drops out of 10 for me. I love the concept, execution, and story behind it. If you enjoyed this Hidden Gem Horror episode, please consider subscribing. This is my first video, and I hope you all enjoyed it. This is a real passion project of mine, and it took an extremely long time to do. As for this film, it's going in the vault.